Hi everyone, my name is Tomiwa Larikomo, CEO of Big Cabal Media. Welcome to The Next Wave by Tech Cabal. The Next Wave is a show where we talk about the next wave of innovation that's cutting across Africa and that's changing the way we live, the way we work, the way we transact. Um, it's an exciting time and we're very excited to be exploring it with you all at home, as well as with um, a range of really interesting guests working at the cutting edge of technology on the continent. Today's our very first edition, and we're exploring the uber-promising world of Africa's fintechs, financial technology companies. Joining us today are Ovo Emorokwa, who's the founding partner at Beta Ventures, Elizabeth Rosiello, founder and CEO of Aza Finance, Lizanne D'Souza, VP of Products at Flutterwave, and Ricardo Schaefer, early stage investor and partner at Target Global. Welcome, Ovo. Good to have you with us. Hi, Tomiwa. Thanks for having me here. Excellent. It's good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you. Yes. Let's jump into the conversation. In 2021, fintechs reportedly accounted for two-thirds of all investments into startups in Africa. And of the eight unicorns that we have on the continent, six of them are fintech companies. So my question for you is, what and how exactly has fintech become such a big force on the continent today? I think it's simple. It's a question of it's a large, very large unmet demand by the African uh, population okay. for financial services and products okay. that the traditional financial institutions were not providing. Okay. So fintechs have come in to fill that gap. Um, and it's only going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, I think over between 2010 and 2022, over 1 trillion US dollars was invested into 35,000 global equity fintech deals. Interesting. Over one trillion. Wow. So I always try to caution people, let's not get too carried away. So our portion our of state. that is really, really re small. But, but uh -huh. that just to tell you that there's still, there's still a long road to a go. A long road to go. A very large opportunities. So while we're happy about the progress of fintech, there's still large opportunities ahead. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, what would you say are the big pivotal um, factors that have made fintech as big as it is on the continent? For me, that's very easy. I would like to start with um, real-time switching. Okay. I think that has been very, very instrumental in uh, driving the adoption uh, and the, first of all, the you know, building of fintech solutions that okay. the end consumers adopt and use. Okay. Um, before I go deep into that, we have to, first of all, uh, you know, say that, look, unlike in the West, uh, Nigeria and most parts of the developing world are low trust, what we call low trust societies, okay. where because of the absence or the limitations of the rule of law, people in, in consuming commercial transactions um, want to be sure that they will get their money. So they have been used to transacting in cash. Okay. Right. But with real time switching, we can transact and I can send a payment to you and you can get the confirmation in real time. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. So that was very, very instrumental in the adoption of um, fintech uh, oh, solutions. The, yeah. um, the other ones I can quickly uh, pinpoint uh, the development of uh, API tools. Um, but even before that is the proliferation of um, lower cost technological uh, servers and other tools that are required to build these solutions. Um, if you, I don't know if you recall 10, 15 years ago, you know, to build, you know, a small application, you needed to provision, you needed to buy servers, giant servers, giant servers <laughs> and um, uh, switches yeah. and all of that. But now you can, um, you know, open up an account with AWS or uh, IBM and you can actually code on your smartphone. And you can have an app running. I don't recommend it, but. <laughs> no, but you no. can. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just, just for illustration purposes, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, real-time switching, uh, low-cost uh, technology tools, yeah. uh, API mm -hmm. um, tools, and then finally, what ties all of that together is availability of low-cost smartphones. That okay. was very, very so instrumental. Changed the game it in Africa. Changed the game in Africa uh, and the developing world. And yes. the developing world. Yes. True. This is true. Yeah. I mean, I think all of that's been great for us. And overall, I think fintechs are building important rails for us. The ability to, we talked a little bit about this before we started, just that ability to move money 
eases commerce yes. and it enables yeah. another layer of commerce. People yeah. can collect money much easier. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're serving customers who ordinarily mm -hmm. wouldn't have access to the system. What's missing, you know, and where are the danger areas or where are the current crop of fintech still not doing enough? Where are the, where are the opportunities from your perspective? We've been, we've all been, you know, very caught up with the fintechs that are uh, what we, in better ventures, we still consider they are going after the low hanging fruit. These are okay. what we call the, the banked people. Okay. People that are, you know, the, you know, so the, customers that already have bank accounts. Customers that are already in the financial system, uh, ecosystem. Somewhere here. Exactly. Okay. You have the BVNs or national ID in different countries. I don't know what they call them. But in Nigeria, we call it BVN for you okay. to participate in the um, regulated financial space. Okay. But there's still a very large market outside of that population. So we're okay. talking about the unbanked. Okay. The unbanked or the underserved. All right. I think there's a large opportunity there okay. and we've not seen a lot of fintechs addressing that large potential market. Uh, we have a company in our portfolio, Ajoka, that is already playing in that space and we've seen very good traction because you don't have a lot of fintechs okay. you know, providing solutions or services to that segment of the population. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's one. And the other one uh, um, where I think we still need a lot more fintechs to play in uh, is in the area of uh, facilitating cross-border um, transactions, payment okay. or movement of value across borders. It's it's more challenging because now you have to deal with, uh, you know, uh, legal legalese, yeah, of, yeah. uh, legal uh, uh, issues in two or three different jurisdictions. Um, so the fintechs are able to crack that very well. It will will be very very valuable going forward. Uh, the third one, it's in the area of uh, what we call settlement and correspondent banking. Okay. Um, we think that is also crying for um, fintech players and solutions. Um, luckily, we have a, another portfolio company that is trying to solve that problem uh, called NABU. Okay. Um, the, 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 the challenge here is that if, if we don't solve that problem, then the friction that Africans and African companies have in trading amongst Africans in Africa and with the global economy remains. And it's actually getting worse by the day where for perceived reasons, some of these major uh, banks, you know, mm -hmm. refuse to settle transactions, transactions. Come on, coming out of Africa. Perceived okay. risk, not, not every transaction is a risky transaction, but for perceived reasons, yeah. uh, they flag almost all transactions as risky and refuse to, um, you know, help settle uh, those types of transactions. So there's an opportunity there also. We see opportunity there also. That's interesting. I mean, let me just let's dig in on a couple of things in there. I think what's interesting in terms of serving the underbanked, mm -hmm. the unbanked or underbanked, yes. is I think there's a big move with agency banking. Yes. There's a big push in that. Yes. Um, and I think that's interesting. We'll, yes. we'll definitely deepen penetration. Mm -hmm. um, I think what, what, what's interesting for me there is how far can you push into rural areas, leaving urban areas, and going in deeper into mm -hmm. countries, mm -hmm. uh, deeper into the countryside across the continent. On the correspondent and settlement banking that you mentioned, what is the problem that has to get solved there? Because this is like a reputation and trust problem, really. So how do you solve that problem? That brings us to another um, evolving area in uh, uh, finance, which is uh, decentralized finance. Okay. That is anchored, on, right. blo on, that's anchored on blockchain. Really. All right, yeah. Um, we, we, at Better Ventures, we've been looking at, you know, the intersection of Web3 and traditional finance. And we think... A lot of people looking at that exactly, space. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And we think that with blockchain, that you can actually begin to address a lot of those um, issues that the traditional international banks, settlement banks, um, raise as issues to flag transactions coming out of Nigeria or other emerging markets, right? Because uh, it's, it's actually very expensive for them. To to be compliant with the you know okay. reg regulatory um, mandates that they operate under in their countries, so rather than pay those heavy uh, compliance um, uh, you know costs, they, they're like you know what it's it's actually cheaper for us to just not participate, participate in that market. But with blockchain comes the ability to you know move some of those you know compliance checks and processes onto the chain. You know, and make drive down the costs. Will that work with their regulators, though? I mean, for a regulated industry. No, I mean, I mean, there are, there are some processes that will be in the background. Gotcha. Okay. Right, so that you can run on the chain. 
Okay. You know, before it gets to the uh, um, reporting it to the regulators. I think that's fair. I think it'll yeah. be interesting to see how that develops. Um, and I think part of our audience here is regulators. Mm -hmm. um, I think the concern just is the day your auditor comes and <laughs> you've got to explain the transactions that have happened on the chain. Yes. Um, but I think definitely an interesting area and I think yes. there are a lot of companies operating in that space. Yes. So, uh, yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Our portfolio company in Nabu is uh, trying to uh, solve that problem okay. primarily for emerging markets, you know, banks, businesses and individuals. You know okay. that face that's you know friction point you know to trade with uh, global counterparties. Fantastic! It's useful. Um, really good to hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to move on some questions for Lizanne, who's joining us virtually. I'd like to start by asking you about where we are headed as an industry. So fintech's been doing really well across the continent. 2021 was an especially intense year from a funding, from an execution, partnerships perspective, but we haven't reached a resting point yet. Earlier this year, Flutterwave launched Flutterwave 3.0, and it was clear that the company has really big ambitions beyond your traditional offerings of payment processing. So I'm curious, when you look at the industry through a global lens, what's the work that's left to be done? I think it goes without saying that there's been a few foundational forces in Africa that have actually supported FinTech adoption. Number one is the high internet penetration uh, that we have specifically in Nigeria um, and Kenya, and that has really contributed to the adoption of fintech services, and that continues to grow, and so it's continuing to help propel us forward. Another big driver is the cost of services, which in large part has to actually do with the cost of technology being driven down by decentralized cloud-based architecture, versus that centralized enterprise architecture. So that low cost of services has really enabled the fintech industry to move forward quickly. And finally, there's really supportive regulation in quite a few markets. Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, all of those regulators in those markets have made a conscious choice to move from that position of gatekeeper to really a catalyst for the industry. But having said that, lots more to be done. Um, Today, we know that the fintech investment remains concentrated in just a few markets in Africa. South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria, and Egypt essentially had 80% of the fundraising uh, come to those markets in 2020. So in order to help us, we have to be able to diversify that out. Ghana, Indi uh, Ghana Ivory Coast, and Senegal are all catching up, but there's more work to be done in expanding that regulatory framework. Um, and then finally, there also needs to be that skilled workforce for fintech to flourish. Many of the companies that are unicorns today have undoubtedly relied on that really strong talent in certain geographies to ideate, build, and innovate uh, and become successful. Uh, Flutterwave has done really well in this area. We have a really strong graduate program for our engineering team uh, to help people move right from out of school into the industry to provide them with that coaching and experience um, and framework to be able to be successful in this industry. So I think really when we look out, um, it's that work that needs to be done in terms of improving that regulatory framework, making it transparent and being able to have uh, talent flourish. I'd like to ask about partnerships. They are a really essential part of the fintech landscape. And that's whether they're fintech to fintech partnerships, fintech to bank, to telco, or fintech to IMTO. How does Flutterwave think about partnerships and how do they feature in your strategy moving forward? So we have definitely looked at partnerships as a core enabler for many of our core products and services. One area that we're focusing a lot on this year is in the lending space and being able to partner with lending institutions in our key markets to be able to extend not just loans to small businesses using our Flutterway for Business platform, but also enable consumers on the other side who are purchasing to be able to have some sort of a credit facility to enable um, stronger purchasing power. Okay. All this is through technology that we facilitate through a referral platform. Uh, that enables access to these services for our core customers. Fantastic. I like the idea of Flutterwave as a platform, and uh, that is a big driver of your ability to move forward. It also means that there's an opportunity for a range of different people to come and partner with you to offer their services 
through you. So that's quite interesting. Thank you so much for joining us, Lizanne. It was really great to have you. We look forward to having you on again soon. Hi, Elizabeth, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the big trends that we are seeing in FinTech. And so some of the big areas are mobile money, agency banking, APIs, buy now, pay later. Which of these do you believe will have the most impact on the sector in the next few years, particularly those that people aren't paying too much attention to just yet? Sure. Well, I think if we go in the reverse, I think agency banking now is old news. You know, it's almost 15 years old, the first agency banking model online that we saw in East Africa. I think what's really exciting now yep. is web-based banking. So that's a combination of using APIs for a new FinTech to kind of connect into different financial services. So you can have one non-bank or, you know, neo-bank app, and it can connect using APIs into an insurance lender, into buy now, pay later, into all sorts of cool wallets, into cryptocurrency providers. So I think what we're going to see is similar to what happened in Europe with TransferWise or Revolut, where you have just a really different type of financial institution come in, and then they link to all the other apps. And I'm hesitant to call it a super app because that brings to mind what the telcos are doing. And I don't think this next revolution is going to be telco led. Interesting. You know, I'm going to push back on you on agency banking a little bit. It's really, it's been around for a while, but I think it's actually one of the more exciting areas. I mean, so I spent a lot of time in the Nigerian market and what we're seeing is sort of a new generation of fintechs really pushing hard on agency backing, pushing it into rural areas, and using some of this web-based APIs that you've talked about to bring on a different range of services to the market. But I'm actually quite excited about what's happening in that space and its opportunity to really shake up the fintech landscape. I don't know if you feel differently about that. Well, maybe we're talking about the same thing. I mean, when I started in Nairobi 15 years ago, agency banking meant an old fashioned brick and mortar bank, really just using an app to offer the exact same services to people who are too far away from the branch. But I think today what you're talking about specifically are different types of new age banks or neo banks or non-bank financial institutions or apps or fintechs offering services on a mobile platform to those same rural populations. And what that means is new entrants can go bigger and can compete with incum incumbents in a way that we really never could 15 years ago when we were scratching up seed in the garden. Um, so I think what, what we're seeing now is new entrants really able to challenge those big names. And, you know, that's where the growth is outside urban areas. That's the untouched market share in a lot of ways where there's so many financial products that can be distributed. And whether you want to call it agency banking or you know, neo-banking or non-bank financial institutions, whatever it is, I think it's going to be new brands, new companies working together via API and partnerships, everything delivered over web or, or mobile and a whole new experience for the user. Absolutely. I think you're definitely right on that. Um, we're seeing lots and lots of that investment in neo-banks, new fintech platforms. And it's definitely providing an interesting challenge to the, to the more traditional banks. And I wonder... I'd be interested in seeing what they do to catch up in this space or if they continue to be sort of like outlapped in this sort of like revolution uh, by the fintechs. I'm going to move a little bit um, into the next question. Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the largest mobile markets in the world. In 2021, 157 of the world's live mobile money services were in Sub-Saharan Africa. What do you think are the most interesting opportunities to build around that, particularly in areas like East Africa, North Africa? What's exciting there? I think it's been a decade, but we're still in need of interoperability. Mm. I think we yep. still haven't conquered that in so many ways. We're privileged to be at the place in our growth cycle where we're acquiring companies and we're, you know, really playing a lot in M&A. And we're looking at so many young companies and there are just very few that have gone beyond their home market. And when yep. you're talking about mobile money, it's supposed to be digital. It's supposed to be universal. But so many of these products and entrants are not even just domestic, but just a corner of a domestic market. And yep. I think that's something that really needs to be tackled. And that's why the telecoms 
kept the monopoly for so long is because they were in multiple markets, even if the technology was different. And we all know, you know, MCN different, has yeah. different systems <laughs> in different markets. So I think for for what I'm looking for and, and when I'm in the market talking to people, I'm looking for those new entrants that are able to go cross border, truly cross border. So, you know, launching a mobile app is cool in your home market or your home city, but taking it to the next level means an operational focus that we're still not seeing from a lot of the young fintechs. And I hope all this new money coming in is going to make that happen. I'm going to ask one last question, which is around banking the unbanked, which is what everybody says they're doing. Um, but frequently, what we see is that people are banking the already banked. You know, they might be a bit thinly banked, but they already have a national insurance number or a banking verification number. So they're already in the system in some way. And so I guess my question for you is, especially with digital currencies, which are also only targeting a very small portion of the population, how, how do we grow this? How does kind of that financial inclusion actually start to draw in people who aren't already somewhat in the financial system? So that was a bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll try to answer them all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. I speak about this a lot, but I worked in microfinance for quite a few years before I started as a finance, and I was in the field all over sub-Saharan Africa. And the number one thing we kept discovering when I was doing ratings of these microfinance institutions was that they were all banking the exact same customers. So yep. you would find one really savvy market woman with five microfinance bank applications and <laughs> loans. And then all the women next to her were what they deemed unbankable with no access to finance. So access to finance is a very strange term. It's very hard to measure. And there's a lot of issues with data collection, et cetera. People want the best customers. They want the ones that pay. They want the ones that grow. So it's very hard to motivate for-profit companies to really go and service everybody, even the customers that are not going to pay or pay back, et cetera. And you see a real huddle around urban and peri-urban areas, not just because it's easier to get to those customers, but because of their financial lifetime, average average uh, transaction volume, et cetera. What, what I would like to see now is you know thinking about access to finance in different ways. Okay. We always say unless every farmer in the country or every senior citizen living in a remote area has a bank account, then access to finance is not realized. But what about all the other financial services? You know, what about students who don't have access to student loans or you know, young, young graduates who don't have access to home loans or who don't have access to growing their small business loans? I really like to think of it as a multi, much more multi-layered. I think there's too much focus in the development world and in general on access to finance for rural agricultural base, you know, people of a certain age. I think it's just very, you know, one faceted. Of course we need to do that, but there's a whole rainbow of financial services that need to be introduced and grown across the continent. And what I see right now is I see a lot of the digital currencies, they're not just for rich, you know, young men, they're really for a lot of students. And they're for a lot of young entrepreneurs and they're for a lot of teenagers. And that's really exciting. And I see a lot of the neobanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a really, really interesting conversation. Um, look forward to talking to you again as we proceed. I think there's a lot of interesting sort of things happening in this space. But thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Ricardo. How are you? Hey, how are you? I am good, thank you. Thanks for being here. So African FinTech is hitting record highs, yet there's still a really long way for us to go. In your opinion, do we need more FinTechs? And in what subsectors do we need them? Where, where do we need to push forward? Yes, yeah, so look, great, great, great question. Um, I think, look, in a, let me take a kind of first a general view, right? I think the premise for the success of, of, of FinTech is uh, offering a generally kind of better customer experience, right? So better UX, it's mobile first, and, and a lot of B2C kind of fintech business models. You know, you have a digital onboarding. Uh, you, you know, you don't need to go to uh, to, to to a bank, uh, to a physical branch, or to to a broker. So uh, I think particularly in Africa, uh, fintech is a is a really important pillar for economic development, right? So uh, to answer your your, your question. Uh, we we'll definitely need more fintechs. Uh, I think we're just at the beginning. 
Uh, I think they play a, a really important role when it comes to financial inclusion. Uh, if you think about, for example, providing better financial services in, say, rural areas, uh, if you think of, uh, for example, insurance products, we have a great company in Nigeria called Cassava, which is offering uh, income protection and health protection, which is still really nascent in, in, in Africa and I think is really, really important. Uh, and, you know, just kind of the, the list is endless, Re retirement provisions, um, etc. So. I think it's a really, really important part of uh, um, kind of providing uh, um, or, or important pillars, as I said, for economic development. And uh, I, I think it's also important to, particularly in Africa, to see that uh, a lot of the banks are actually commercial banks. Uh, so they work, you know, uh, their main customers are governments or big corporates, and they very often neglect uh, the uh, the consumers. So there's a real, uh, there's a real kind of, um, uh, opportunity here for fintechs to fill that gap and and uh, yeah provide generally kind of better financial uh, services and it really goes into kind of all all kind of sub sectors I'd say absolutely um, I agree with you I think there's a lot more for us to do um, at our current growth rate what does the future look like for African fintech you know in a few years a decade say how do we compare to established markets if you if you look at the last couple of years, you know, fintech has been, I think, in, in, in technology, that one sector that, that stood out, right? I think there's like almost 200 uh, fintech unicorns uh, globally. Uh, they've kind of been growing rapidly over the last couple of years. And, and also in Africa, right? If you, if you look at the, the, the companies that are valued above a billion dollars, the majority of those are, uh, are fintechs. Um, uh, compared to... Yeah, kind of outside of out, uh, you know, on a, on a global comparison, there's obviously uh, very few, and I think that will change rapidly over the over the next couple of years. So we'll see a lot more kind of fintech unicorns coming out from all from all parts of Africa. Um, the, I, I think what what's 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 driving this is a number of uh, developments. On on one hand, again taking a step back, right? If you look at what's actually happened in fintech. Over the last couple of years, you, you had kind of the unbundling of the bank, right? So you had um, the focus on infrastructure plays, so providing better kind of modular tech stacks. Um, and, and then you had obviously kind of the companies that were focusing on better uh, front end or better customer experience payment. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at kind of remittances, lending, et cetera. Uh, and now what, what you see is, through those kind of fintechs providing infrastructure solutions, it's a lot easier for um, new fintechs to launch companies and to launch products. Okay. And, and then I think we'll see a whole new kind of generation of- Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's been very exciting talking to you about fintech in Africa today. We're really excited about the prospects of the industry and we look forward to having you on again. For those in the audience, thank you so much for joining us today for the very first edition of The Next Wave. Thank you to our guests, Ovo, Elizabeth, Lizanne, and Ricardo. Do join us again this time next week when we'll be talking about how African startups can chart a path to more IPOs. We'd love to hear your thoughts about today's show and about the topics that we speak about. You can tweet at us using the hashtag TheNextWaveCNBC. You can also send your feedback via email to TheNextWave at TechCabal.com. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.